Good afternoon. I'm Tina Cheng, Chair of the Department of Pediatrics, Chief Medical Officer and Director of the Cincinnati Children's Research Foundation, and want to welcome you to Envisioning Our Future for Children, our speaker series really talking about the future for children, the science, the clinical care, and the education that we need to uh, achieve that vision. We've had a luminary, uh, uh, a large number of luminary speakers, um, including today, um, and are really proud to, uh, to be thinking uh, about what the future holds. Uh, all of these previous speakers are online, uh, and you can see them uh, online for your viewing at the envisioningourfuture.org uh, website. Um, and today we have a luminary speaker that I'm going to pass over to uh, Dr. Neeru Hershey to introduce. Great, thanks, Tina. Well, we're just thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Diana Bianchi, who will be discussing the future of pediatric research, a view from the crossroads. Dr. Bianchi is the director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. She's also the head of the prenatal genomics and therapy section for the medical genetics branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute, where she leads a $1.6 billion research portfolio that focuses on children, reproductive biology, and pregnancy, as well as physical and intellectual disabilities. Dr. Bianchi received her MD from Stanford University and then went on to postgraduate training in pediatrics, medical genetics, and perinatal medicine at Harvard University. Her research focuses on non-invasive prenatal screening and the development of novel fetal therapies for genetic disorders. She has published over 350 peer-reviewed articles and is one of the four authors of Fetology, which won the American the Association of American Publishers Award for Best Textbook in Clinical Medicine in 2000. Dr. Bianchi has held multiple leadership positions, including presidencies of the International Society for Prenatal Diagnosis, the Perinatal Research Society, council memberships in the SPR and the APS, and she's a member of the board of directors for the American Society of Human Genetics. She served as editor of editor-in-chief for the journal Prenatal Diagnosis, and she's received numerous prestigious awards, including the Neonatal Landmark Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Marine Andrew Award for Mentorship from the, from the SPR, the Colonel Harlan Sanders Award for Lifetime Achievement in Medical Genetics, and the Pioneer Award from the ISPD, in 2013, she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. I'm truly delighted that she's joining us here today uh, to give her talk in the Envisioning Our Future for Children series. And again, her talk this morning is entitled The Future of Pediatric Research, A View from the Crossroads. Welcome, Dr. Bianchi. Thank you so much, Dr. Hershey and Dr. Chang, uh, for your wonderful invitation. I'm truly honored to be part of this uh, series. I have to say your video gave me chills. It was really wonderful. And one of the things I do miss about my current position is I don't get to interact directly with children anymore, but I hope to change that in the near future. Um, so I am going to share my screen and we will get started. Excellent. Um, I hope that you can see this in power in the uh, full PowerPoint mode. If you can't, I hope someone will let me know. But it, it looks like um, that uh, at least I can. So um, I'll explain in a moment why I titled this talk "A View from the Crossroads." But first, I wanted to wish a, a happy 100th birthday to the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati and a happy 90th birthday to the Research Foundation. NICHD is also celebrating a birthday. We're a bit younger than you are. Um, it, it will be our 60th birthday in a little less than two weeks. And we are having an anniversary symposium in honor of this milestone. Um, it will 
really focus on our vision of healthy pregnancies, healthy children, and healthy and optimal lives. Registration is free and all are welcome. And um, you can either take a photo of this slide or you can go to the NICHD 60th anniversary webpage. And if you just type into Google NICHD 60 years, everything that you need should come up. Um, even just looking at the webpage, we'll tell you a little bit about our history, some of our key advances and milestones. Um, and we've been uh, focusing on different people within the Institute who help us to achieve our mission. And there's a little bit there about future research directions, but that's really the focus of what we're gonna be talking about today. So I was instructed to talk about the future of pediatric research, and I decided that it would be most informative in the time that we have to talk about it from the NIH perspective. I am not going to talk about COVID-19. I made that as a, that was an intentional decision because my hope is in the future that uh, COVID-19 will, I mean, there may be other infections that we'll have to deal with, but it will not be the almost exclusive focus that we've all had for the last two and a half years. I've divided the talk, I mean, why, does, why did I say crossroads? I divided it into a horizontal road and a vertical road. And I'm using the horizontal horizon to talk a little bit about what's happened in the last five or six years in terms of bringing together the entire pediatric research community at NIH and opportunities for NIH researchers to collaborate intramurally, as well as resources that are available for research, both on campus and outside of campus. But a, an important theme that runs through NICHD's research is child health and the health of people across the lifespan. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about connecting the science across the lifespan also how we have advocated for pediatric inclusion in so many NIH-wide major initiatives. I'm gonna end with expanding the diversity of the pediatric research uh, workforce, and then hopefully I will leave a lot of time for questions, which I welcome. So let's get started. When I first arrived, um, at NICHD in November of 2016. This was following uh, an entire career in academic medicine, first at Harvard and Boston Children's, and then at Tufts and the Floating Hospital for Children. And uh, all of my research was funded by NICHD. I did not realize how much pediatric research was funded at other institutes. In fact, NICHD only funds 16% of total pediatric research across the NIH. And amazingly, when you count all of the projects that touch children, the total is more than $4 billion. That is almost as much as the NCI, which is one of the, which is the biggest institute. So if, if we put all pediatric research into one institute, it would probably be the third biggest of the institutes. Our, current budget, as you heard earlier, is 1.68 billion. But as we found out, nearly every institute and center supports pediatric research to some extent, some more than others. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we were all talking with each other? And when I, when I first arrived, that, that wasn't happening. So um, particularly in communicating with Congress, you would have one institute saying one thing, another institute saying another thing as it relates to child health. And um, it was really important to bring everybody together to act as a group, to advocate for child health, to gather the wisdom and the expertise of so many people in different um, different areas of research, different subspecialties. And remember, there are 27 institutes and centers at NIH. And this group meets every other month. There's a website that's dedicated to this group. You can see the members. And this has been a group that has actually gotten things done. And um, it, it's just been great. People are truly committed to it. 
And um, I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the things that um, we've done. One has been a focus on the adolescent transition to adulthood. There's, there's a major gap in research that addresses the needs, particularly of adolescents with chronic illness. When COVID-19 first, first hit in, in March of 2021, you remember that the focus was not on children, particularly at NIH. There was an, almost no focus from Congress on children. There was no funding specifically given to address issues in children with COVID-19. But this group immediately went to work and started talking about and, and really fleshing out priorities for research on COVID-19 so that when the money did come a few months later, they were ready to go. They were ready to get out those funding opportunity announcements. And there's there's been uh, you know a long-standing interest in um, developing the pediatric research workforce, and that's an area where we can certainly work with all of you. And most uh, recently, uh, working with industry and the foundation for NIH on pediatric medical devices. Another area um, that really needs to be addressed, and I'm happy to say that um, it is being addressed is what's happening in the NIH Clinical Center with regard to pediatric research. There are a number of issues. Um, so let me just go to the next slide, and just tell you a little bit about the Clinical Center, which you see here in a photograph. I don't think, if you haven't been to the NIH campus, you probably don't know that there's this massive hospital in the middle of the campus. The campus itself looks like a big, very nice university campus. The clinical center is an enormous resource. And when members of Congress come to the NIH, they always go to the clinical center where they are shown a variety of very impressive uh, protocols, equipment, interactions with patients, et cetera. The wonderful and unique thing about the clinical center is that everyone who comes in the door has to participate in a research pro protocol. Although care is provided, you are there on a research protocol. And what I really like about it is that the funding model provides opportunity for research equity. So there are absolutely no costs to participants who are, who are getting involved in research, but they're also getting care. And one of my research protocols involves bringing in pregnant people who have had um, unusual non-invasive prenatal genomic screening results, and we are providing them with a day and a half of a very complete workup that includes a whole body MRI, for example, um, to determine whether or not they have an underlying malignancy that is the reason for these unusual results. So we can bring these participants in from all over the country. We pay for their airfare, we pay for their hotel, and they get all of their medical care, which um, and all the test results, which are then actionable. So it's really quite remarkable. There are about 1,600 active research studies ongoing there, and half of them relate to the natural history of disease, especially rare genetic diseases. Um, most, mo most of the other studies involve clinical trials, uh, often first in human studies of new drugs and therapies. There's a huge CAR-T program for cancer, for example. And one of the things that really surprised us as a result of the strategic planning process, I'm going to tell you about in a moment, we had no idea that there were 250 credentialed pediatricians on staff. So I'm a member of the Clinical Center Governing Board, um, and this the strategic planning came out of discussions that we were having about revamping the clinical center, trying to make it more inclusive of different populations. And, and it was pretty obvious that there were some big time limitations on what we could do for pediatric research. It's not like a children's hospital. We don't, even though we have 250 pediatricians, um, they're not all involved in clinical care. So the kind of subspecialty coverage that is needed for critically ill children is not currently there. So for that reason, um, 
in general, children under age three are not participating in research protocols at the present time. But our charge to our working group, which is ongoing right now, is to identify the most impactful scientific areas of pediatric research in which the NIH can play a major role to substantially improve child health. So we have this unique opportunity where we don't have to worry about costs in the same way that an academic medical center does, and we don't have to worry about the patients paying for this. So with that horizon scanning, we are performing this long-term strategic planning for pediatric research at the clinical center to occur over the next decade and beyond. And we certainly will welcome your ideas as to what we could do that perhaps you could not do in the center of an academic medical center. Another opportunity I wanted to tell you about is that we are, NICHD supports the Pediatric Scientist mm -hmm. Development Program, and that's mainly an extramural program that used to be based at Cincinnati Children's. And um, it's such a great program that we would like to have a parallel opportunity within the walls at NIH. So Dr. Denny Porter, who is um, a pediatric geneticist and the former clinical director at NICHD, is spearheading uh, this parallel track to the PSDP with the intent that we would support initially one and then hopefully more pediatric scientists who want to do their clinical training. They could either do it in the Washington area or they could do it at another institution, but then they do their research component at the NIH while participating in the national opportunities associated with the PSDP. So we're hoping that this will be a great new opportunity for future clinician scientists. And, I, and I, um, we, we made it agnostic in terms of subspecialty because um, there's so much science going on across NIH, it was hard to say, well, it's only gonna to relate to neonates, or it's only gonna to relate to endocrine disorders. So um, we, we just broadened uh, the opportunity for anybody who is going to be a subspecialist in pediatrics, but that would also include um, uh, epidemiology because we have an intramural epidemiology program, and it also would include, um, you know, areas of transition, so people who are double boarded, et cetera. Another resource that I think is gonna be important now and for the future is our data and specimen hub. Um, I always like to bring this up because people, at least one person always tells me, oh, I didn't know about this. How come I didn't know about this? This is a fantastic opportunity for future research. These are all of our major studies, including multiple clinical trials, have been de-identified and put into easily accessible data sets. So for example, there are 204 studies that are available now. And I like to, to say that this is a great opportunity, particularly for residents or fellows who would like to start doing research, but who don't have the time to go through an IRB approval process or don't have the time to recruit specimens. We've got studies and we've got an additional nine studies that are offering biospecimens. And you can see on the right here that the currently available biospecimens include blood, breast milk, amniotic fluid, DNA, et cetera. And um, you only pay for the shipping. The specimens are already collected and linked to clinical clinical trial data. Uh, this has been enormously successful. We have nearly 500 data requests um, on 53 of the study topics. And um, we've had 11 biospecimen requests and um, we have had 74 publications that have used some of the data. Um, this is a little, this is just an example of one study which happens to be our most popular study. This was a, a study called the Consortium on Safe Labor. And the data was basically looking at um, 
all kinds of things related to labor and delivery. And um, out of the nearly 500 requests for data, about a quarter of them have been for this particular study. And 39 of the publications out of the 74 that have been associated with the DASH resource are all related to the study. And um, there was just an article that just came out this past month using a machine learning model to um, determine you know, bet in a better way how and when to make certain decisions about delivering, um, you know, whether to let labor progress for a vaginal delivery or whether to go ahead and do a cesarean section if and when. And um, I, I, in this particular study that was recently published, um, the authors said right up front, they had nothing to do with the data. They, they used the data from this particular study. And the study collected detailed information from um, electronic medical records in over 200,000 deliveries from 19 hospitals um, collected in the US from 2002 to 2008, NICHD supported study, and then cleaned and anonymized and put into DASH in 2016. So those are just examples that I can give you in the, with the limit of time that I have. I did want to think vertically as well, and in particular, NICHD has always had a focus on um, research and health across the lifespan. In fact, we were the first institute to focus on a particular part of the lifespan, and it was later after our formation that aging was carved off into a separate institute. So I'm going to go more or less chronologically in uh, a lifespan and just tell you about some of the things that I think will be very important for the future of child research. The first thing is the IMPROVE initiative, which is new. IMPROVE is an acronym for implementing a maternal health and pregnancy outcomes vision for everyone. This is an NIH-wide effort um, which is really addressing preventable causes of maternal deaths and improving women, uh, the health for women before, during, and after delivery. And after delivery is frequently forgotten, but now recent CDC data shows that it accounts for over half of maternal deaths occur in the year after delivery. Um, the, the initiative is emphasizing health disparities, particularly in Black and American Indian and Alaska Native women and uh, other disproportionately affected populations, such as rural populations or women who are in maternity deserts. Um, you know, I said we, we fund 16% of pediatric research across NIH. I think the latest is that we fund about 48% of maternal health research across NIH. So um, we are by far the lead institute in both areas, but by far disproportionately much more so in maternal health. And that message has gotten through to Congress because they gave us in fiscal year 22 in the budget, a new appropriation of $30 million that goes into our base so that if Congress, when they finally get around to a fiscal year 23 budget, if they, if they give a 3% increase, let's say, it's that much more because we have the $30 million for improve in our base. That was the good news. The bad news was that we got the budget March 15, 2022, so we had just about six months to do 12 months worth of work. And I wanna just really give kudos to the staffs of all the institutes who are involved in the IMPROVE initiative who worked like crazy to move mountains. And um, many of the funding opportunities have already you know, been appropriated for fiscal year 22, but the focus has been on partnering with community organizations to understand their specific needs. Um, what I might perceive as being important is gonna be very different from what the specific community is going to say is important. And that became very obvious to me when I did my first tribal consultation a few months ago. And um, 
speaking with a representative from the Navajo Nation, um, the woman told me that their biggest issue was, was getting access to healthy food. The, the reservation was so enormous, transportation was a major issue, and just um, having the ability to have food healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables delivered to the reservation was a major issue. Um, so hearing about specific details like that has been incredibly important. But many of these community organizations, if they're not directly partnered with, a with an academic medical center, don't know where to start. So we have funded, or we are about to fund a number of challenges where we're asking community organizations to partner with us to tell us what they need, and we will give them infrastructure so that they can build the infrastructure and then become part of uh, the centers of excellence that will be funded in fiscal year 23. We're also very aware of the disparities that occur between women who are in areas that have excellent maternal care and ones who have no access to maternal care. So we have another challenge that is ongoing to develop technology that can be used in a remote setting, um, point of care being the home. Um, and we have a number of community implementation studies looking at interventions that have already proven to be promising. And we are also working with the P. Corey Foundation to link um, both the pregnant person and the child, as well as the pregnant person across pregnancy. And then lastly, we um, have already funded a number of initiatives that are looking at disseminating and implementing best practice. Just a brief, um, again, thinking vertically, NICHD has been very involved in prenatal screening and diagnosis from the 1970s onwards when um, NIC research, NICHD research provided evidence for safety and accuracy of amniocentesis, and then subsequently uh, funded non-invasive prenatal screening to isolate fetal cells from maternal blood. And that has morphed into non-invasive prenatal screening using cell-free DNA um, and all kinds of exome and genomic sequencing for fetuses with anomalies. And I'm mentioning this because this is an area um, that my own laboratory has worked in for many years. Um, I think that treatment, especially antenatally, will be extremely important in the future. But NICHD has been a prime player along with NHGRI in newborn screening. So newborn screening programs, as you all know, screen more than 4 million infants per year. Um, we work with the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. And um, those committees really rely on data that come from preliminary projects that are funded by NICHD. Um, and most notably, we've recently funded the Newborn Sequencing in Genomic Medicine and Public Health, the INSIGHT program. And that is um, that has really shown some very interesting results. I think that, you know, I'm sure that you're experiencing Cincinnati Children's that critically ill neonates are now increasingly getting sequenced. And that has resulted in both the recognition of new disorders has changed management um, for certain conditions that have no treatment. Um, some of these children then go home and get comfort care. Um, complete change in therapy in terms of nutrition or vitamin supplements once metabolic disorders um, have been determined. Uh, Stephen Kingsmore, who's at Rady Children's in San Diego, has really been a pioneer in this area. He is an NICHD grantee. And Robert Green, um, who is at Brigham and Women's, has been very interested in potentially actionable variants in the genomes of healthy newborns. So I, I, I raise this because I do think that um, genomic sequencing will be a part of the future of research. It may not be our 
our highest priority in terms of public health, but I do think it is going to play a role in the future. Similarly, um, we are participating in the Gabriella Miller Kids First Research Program. It's supported by several NIH institutes and centers. It is specifically appropriated by Congress. Um, Gabriella Miller was a young, young child who, well, she died at age 10 or 11 um, from brain cancer. And this program was envisioned as a way to use genomic sequencing to both address cancer and birth defects. Now, I bring it up because it's another one of these major resources to empower discovery. Everything is in the cloud. Um, many researchers, similar to the DASH research, uh, many researchers are using the Kids First data and the resources that are publicly available to answer new questions. Um, the, the data access is growing as more people learn about this. Um, and we also have several programs that um, are supporting trainees and how to use some of these new data types. So Kids First, first also links phenotypic clinical data with genomics and transcriptomics. Another program where we've been extremely involved in is the INCLUDE project. So another acronym, investigating co-occurring co conditions across the lifespan to understand Down syndrome. And um, this, this has truly been a transformative program. And um, I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned since I've been at NIH is that you can move the needle. So this is a program and I can say this from personal experience because my laboratory has been working on therapies in Down syndrome. And uh, it was very, very hard to get funded because there was very little money available for research on Down syndrome. And then in 2017, a self-advocate with Down syndrome named Mr. Frank Stevens, um, presented in Congress and received a standing ovation. And suddenly the funding stream turned around and almost overnight, we were told to create a program that would address some of the major needs in Down syndrome. And so, as you can see here, we came up with three components that are really meant to simultaneously understand why do people with Down syndrome almost invariably have Alzheimer's disease, but they almost never get other conditions that are common in people of the same age, like myocardial infarction or solid tumors? So um, we, we thought that the research would equally benefit people with Down syndrome and people who don't have Down syndrome. But importantly, it was also called INCLUDE so that we could include people with Down syndrome in existing and future clinical trials. You know, many clinical trials exclude people with congenital anomalies or genetic conditions or intellectual disability. And, and we thought that was wrong. And uh, so the, the funding stream has more than doubled um, for for this particular condition, it has truly transformed the community of researchers. It has, it has transformed the engagement of people and families who um, either have Down syndrome or are interested in Down syndrome. And we are creating a pipeline of researchers. So I'm very proud of this. And uh, we just last week met with Senator Jerry Moran from, from Kansas, who will likely either be the chair of the Senate Appropriations uh, Subcommittee that funds NIH, or he will be the uh, ranking member, depending on which way the Senate goes. But he is the Senate co-chair for Down syndrome. Um, and you know he was absolutely thrilled with what we've done with this program. Um, just a couple of other things, nutrition. So our staff has been incredibly involved in the NIH overall plan for nutrition research. And I've mentioned nutrition because I think that that is one of the top three health needs 
uh, for children and families that must be addressed, either undernutrition, overnutrition, poor nutrition. I am a big believer in nutrition as medicine, and, and we have to ensure a source of healthy foods for everyone. Um, but I, I want to say that our staff made absolutely sure that uh, developmental origins of health and disease were included in this overall plan, um, the role of prenatal nutrition, as well as breastfeeding, all of the elements from a pediatric lens are included in this um, plan, as well as the Nutrition for Precision Health program. Even though we don't have a child yet enrolled in all of us, the plan is there to look at nutrition in this overall um, initiative powered by the All of Us program. Um, just, I think this is the last one, climate change and human health, which is extremely important. I mean, especially in light of the Hurricane Ian last week, um, we have been working very hard with multiple other institutes to uh, put forward an initiative. Initially in the president's budget, he had proposed $100 million. Uh, Congress did not give a dime for this, but the institutes are so committed that we all contributed um, to the overall initiative, which is being led by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And uh, we think that this is going to be an extremely important issue for future research. And climate change is very important to our populations, you know, whether they're underserved, whether they are particularly vulnerable because of their life stage. And at NICHD, we're also the home of the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research. So we are always concerned about persons with disabilities. And of course, I read in the newspaper about some of the enormous challenges um, for caretakers trying to get their uh, folks out of harm's way with the hurricane last week and the flooding and trying to get disabled people out of harm's way. Just was, oh, one more. The Helping to End Addiction Long-Term um, Initiative. So again, advocating for the inclusion of children and um, uh, neonates and postpartum people in this initiative. So we have a number of ongoing studies. I know many of them are um, ongoing in Ohio right now. The Eat, Sleep and Console clinical trial compared to standard of care, the enrollment's been completed. We're eagerly waiting the analysis. Um, we, because there is no national standard for treatment of neonates with opioid withdrawal, uh, we're looking at all of the various alternatives and those studies are enrolling. Um, we've also completed enrollment for the prescription after cesarean trial where postpartum people are given massive amounts of opioids and that is a very significant contribution to opioid um, addiction and withdrawal. And then we have a new opportunity coming that is going to be looking at the effects of opioid exposure on placental function and brain development in neonates. Okay, so just completing the lifespan. Um, as I said, we, we've noticed a gap in research related to adolescence. In fact, in our most recent strategic plan, we included a whole theme that made sure to mention adolescence as well as the transition to adulthood, especially for those adolescents with chronic conditions or intellectual or physical disabilities. And so we held a workshop now a couple of years ago that um, talked about some of the challenges that are experienced by these populations as well as how how would we measure successful trans transitions? And um, there, there has been a notice of special interest published. We're very interested in grants that address these issues. And um, this, as, as well as all of our um, workshops are recorded and publicly available. So before we end, because I want to leave some time for discussion, I just 
want to mention some of the NIH wide efforts to include um, diversity, to increase diversity and inclusion in the pediatric workforce. You may have heard about the NIH's Unite initiative. NICHD has its own version of that, which is called STRIVE or Strategies to Enrich Inclusion and Achieve Equity. We're looking specifically at equity, diversity, and inclusion in our internal workforce, as well as the extramural scientific workforce, which is all of you. And we're expanding our portfolio in health disparities research. These are some of the activities that we've had recently, most recently multiple listening sessions to better understand scientific workforce diversity from four perspectives, from a trainee perspective, from the early stage investigator perspective, from established PIs and academic leaders and professional organizations. And um, we've been asking them what best contributes to diversity in research at each of these career stages and bar in trying to identify barriers and support, uh, supports that uh, will impact either positively or negatively on one's ability to succeed in the scientific workforce. And some of the common themes that have come out of these listening sessions include the need for culturally sensitive, sincere, and supportive mentorship at all career stages, along with institutional support for mentorship training. And one size does not fit all. So we need to accommodate different needs and we need to do purposeful and continual outreach to make scientific careers more visible. Um, we are actively discriminating, actively addressing discrimination and biases in the workforce, and we're also providing financial and grant writing support. The very last thing I want to mention is just mitigating bias in the NIH peer review. This is something that you probably don't think about. I hear people talking about, I'm going to submit a grant to NICHD. You really don't submit your grants to NICHD, you submit your grants to the Center for Scientific Review, unless it is a special project with set aside money, then an internal um, study section will do the review. But the majority of grant applications are reviewed by CSR. And their director, Dr. Noni Burns, it, it's just terrific. And she's really thinking a lot about where bias occurs in multiple levels of the peer review system. Um, so, and she, she's doing all kinds of experiments. So for, for one, she's been exploring uh, a blinded review process. And the pilot study showed that the anonymous process affected um, the decision to apply for 25% of the respondents. So people um, were more likely to apply if they knew that their review was going to be blinded. Um, this particular pilot study resulted in a statistically significant increase in diversity of the applicant pool. We're, we're very concerned across NIH that so much of the research dollars of NIH really go to a small percentage of investigators and a small percentage of institutions. In addition, she started a bias awareness peer review training for reviewers and chairs. Some of you have already maybe experienced this training. Um, the feedback has been really, really positive, and people have said that they were totally unaware of areas where biases could review. This is not implicit bias. This is just specific parts of the application where biases can occur. Um, and she's also uh, really doing a lot to broaden the reviewer pool, to diversify review committees, both from uh, a life perspective as well as a career stage. So um, she has already increased um, the reviewer pool uh, by expanding early career reviewers who have a higher percentage of underrepresented minorities. So these are all positive things. So those are the comments that I wanted to make. I was told that the next part would involve some of the questions 
um, that I've written here, which are adapted from the instructions that I received. So what collaborations could facilitate progress in scientific innovation in the next one to two decades? I've covered many of those within NIH. I didn't talk about partnering with other federal agencies such as the FDA or the CDC, um, but we can get to that in the, in the questions. What's the most impactful change or innovation in science that will transform how we operate? I've mentioned some things. I've mentioned the importance of sharing data, big data, uh, genomics, uh, diversifying the workforce. I didn't get a chance to men mention industry collaboration, but I think that that will be very important as well. And what are the top three needs of children and families that must be addressed? So I did mention some of those, um, obviously nutrition, public health, education, um, addressing mental health, but we can, we'll see what the questions bring up. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and again, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. And I'm gonna stop sharing so we can talk. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Bianchi. That was really wonderful. And happy 60th birthday to NICHD. That's very exciting. And it sounds like a wonderful symposium. I'm sure a lot of people are, are gonna join you um, for that. And thanks also for sharing all of the outstanding initiatives. I mean, I love the way you organized your talk sort of across the lifespan. And I wonder if we could start there with a question because that really is so, um, so important. And a lot of disease starts in early life um, and pediatricians know that, right? Whether it's exposures, adverse exposures or adverse events or genetics, can you comment on what are the things that you think we need to do to position ourselves for research in this area and also for just operations in general? Well, I, you know, I think one of our challenges is also one of our opportunities, but it is a challenge because we are dealing with developing humans. So obviously a fetus or a neonate is very different from a young adult, and yet our specialty covers all of them. I mean, my focus and indeed part of the focus of the Institute is really on that transition between fetus and neonate, but there's the other transition at the other end between adolescent and adult. And I think that in, you know, to some extent, research funding has ignored both of those transitions with most concentration being on the period from neonates you know, through uh, adolescence. Um, in terms of operations, I think it's, it's you know, I, I think many institutions look at it differently. It's very hard to be an expert in everything. So that was one of the challenges that we addressed with our strategic plan. We had no focus. So I'm assuming that your research institute has folk, you know, a focus in certain areas. Um, so from an operations perspective, I think strategic planning is important and going deep rather than going broad and shallow. Because NI, NICHD was very broad and shallow. There were multiple areas where we only had one or two grants and you couldn't really say anything about that area. When people asked me, you know, what are our biggest achievements? It was very hard to say what it was because we, we had not defined our focus. Our vision was health across the lifespan. What does that mean? Yeah. So I, I have another question. What kind of infrastructure are NICHD and the NIH and the, the larger entity supporting to create flow from um, academic centers and, and research entities to community partners? Well, again, I think traditionally, um, some of these community relationships are clear partnerships, ge clear geographic partnerships, I would say, where either the academic center has a footprint in a community clinic. 
we've decided that that is going to you know leave out significant numbers of of populations and communities for example tribal nations um it's 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 a real challenge to get into communities that are not either geographically close to an academic medical center in rural areas um, or communities that just historically have have been left out or who are underserved. So you can see it. I said I wouldn't talk about COVID, but COVID is actually a good example because there was a lot of progress made um, through the SEAL program, which was one of the big initiatives for COVID where uh, for testing purposes, relationships were established with, with community centers, with um, religious organizations, um, other trusted organizations within the community to spread the word how important it was to get tested for COVID. And I think we learned a lot because of that, that it's not as difficult as you would think to set up infrastructure in communities. I mean, from NICHD's perspective, we set up um, some really interesting testing settings in, in schools so that um, particularly teenagers, we, they, they even did research through our um, um, radical acceleration of diagnostics program um, in underserved populations. We funded a, a program in St. Louis where in an underserved area where, where the high schoolers did, did research to determine whether people preferred sal salivary testing or nasal swabbing. And, um, and the, the surprising answer was nasal swabbing because it was quicker. That's why they liked it. So, you know, I, I think it'd be impossible to say one particular solution, but I would say philosophically and operationally, there's much more involvement in communities now post COVID than there was pre-COVID from the NIH perspective. Yeah, thank you. There's another question in the chat. Would you please comment on research on violence, injury prevention, and trauma care targeting children and adolescents as one of the NICHD funding priorities? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, so violence, it turns out, is one of the um, lowest funded situations or topics, you know, if you compare how many people are exposed to it or how many people have the condition and what's the funding, violence is unfortunately one of the lowest. However, um, there was, I believe it was an $11 million appropriation last year to address violence. We have a, uh, one of our 12 branches in our extramural program is the Pediatric Trauma and Critical Illness Branch. And they um, are the champions for uh, prevention research and also looking at the consequences of violence. So we do have special initiatives if you're interested in looking at what's there. Um, you should go to NICHD's Division of Extramural Research and then specifically look at PTCIB, which is the Pediatric Trauma and Critical Illness Branch. Also, the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences is co-funding many of these research initiatives. So they are also champions on prevention of research. So it's an area that is historically underfunded, but becoming more and more recognized that this is an issue that obviously it's um, one of the largest, if not the largest cause of, of child death, depending which age you look at. Yeah, very sad, but, but true. Yeah. Um, I think we're running short on time, but maybe we'll do one more question that's in the chat. Given the focus on equity and inclusion, are there plans to address the hurdles that face non-US citizen junior investigators who can't apply for K-type awards? Hmm. 
think that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> um, you can come in as a, you know, as a, a postdoc, obviously. Um, I think it's an important issue because there's a tremendous amount of talent around the world, but I think that's more of a State Department issue than an NIH issue. We have a fabulous uh, international affairs office that helps foreign citizens get training um, and they will help if people are um, you know, working on the NIH campus and are, are excellent candidates to progress and, and get a full-time job, then, then our office will work with people to help them get a green card. I mean, I can say that my staff scientist in my laboratory was a non-US citizen, um, was on an H type of visa, uh, you know, as part of becoming a staff scientist at NIH, they worked with him to get a green card. Okay, thanks. One last question that we'll do in the last minute here. What advice would you give early child health researchers? Maybe you can just give us a couple of bullet points. Yeah. Um, so I think the most important thing that I didn't learn, and I wish I had learned, is to um, talk with multiple institutes. When we look at our best funded investigators, they are all funded by multiple, sometimes two, three, four other institutes. So talk to lots of program officials, look at the website, see what the strategic plans are listing as priorities. And the most important message I think I can communicate is that NICHD is not the be all and end all for all of pediatric research. There's a lot of pediatric research being funded at different institutes at NIH. And like I said, I just saw these data recently within the last month. And everybody who is, you know, a big time player with multiple R1s, they, the R1s tend to be funded by multiple institutes. So that would be one thing. The second thing is make sure you are in a training program that is going to give you protected time. Great. Don't, and the third thing is don't moonlight. I've, <laughs> as a mentor, I've seen moonlighting kill many a a uh, promising research career. Now I recognize that's easy for me to say, you know, there are many, you know, there are loan issues. You know, if you, if you have problems with your med school loans, apply for the pediatric loan repayment program. Exactly. We, we give away, I think I signed 110 contracts in the last few weeks. These are transformational. Um, so, so don't go the moonlighting route. <laughs> Work with the NIH to have NIH pay you back for your student loans. They're also, they're not taxable, these resources. Great, so, great advice. Well, Dr. Bianchi, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really just a wonderful presentation and it will um, be available for those who couldn't join and can watch it. Um, just as a reminder for participants, those of you who would like to get CME credit, you must complete the evaluation form within 30 days. You'll be sent an email later today. And please join us on November 3rd for our next speaker in this series, Dr. Lam Robert Langer. Thanks again, Dr. Bianchi. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Hershey and Dr. Chang. And happy birthday. I hope everybody's going to get cake somewhere, <laughs> sometime. <laughs> Same to you. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.